and think it would work. The P-17D was dropped after the RAF redefined their requirement as OR-343, based solely on the Vickers English Electric submissions. Initially, the enforced amalgamation of the two companies was not welcomed. Well, frankly, we thought it was absolutely wrong. We thought it was um, um, a, a, a misjudgment uh, which would lead to cost overrun, delays, um, unnecessarily uh, complications in working out the, uh, this very des complex design, um, which could much easier, easily have been done, much more easily have been done by one firm as a main contractor. Um, uh, and if, if, it did, if that one firm didn't have the, the total manufacturing capacity to cope with the whole program, then they should have subcontracted it out to the other parts of the industry that could take it, take it on. English Electric had already 10 years' experience in building supersonic um, military aircraft. No other firm in this country had. They had the Canberra behind them. And they had a, a design known as the P-17, uh, which was very close indeed to the um, specification which was put down subsequently for TSR-2. Nevertheless, the prime contract was given to, to Vickers. It's true to say that they, their experience lay in subsonic aircraft and in civil aircraft. The only military uh, plane, I think, that they built was the Valiant Bomber, which had um, uh, manifest structural uh, faults in design and was, in fact, withdrawn after five years. So you could say it was a failure. And yet, in spite of the contrast between the two firms' uh, experience and capability, uh, they were told to amalgamate and the prime contract was given to because I think it was mistaken. Uh, English Electric uh, were regarded by the rest of the industry um, uh, as newcomers. Um, the great names, Hawkers, de Havilland's, Vickers, Bristol's, had been companies existing to way back uh, to World War I and even earlier. Uh, English Electric, the name English Electric only came into um, the, the, the general public view after World War II, um, they had built um, very successfully a range of Hamden and Halifax bombers under license from Handy Page during the war. And then on the basis of that, a new design team was formed in 1945, um, specifically to design and build for the RAF its first jet bomber, the Canberra. Um, they, we were, uh, English Electric were regarded as newcomers by the rest of industry, and I think slightly resented for that. By any standards at that time, TSR-2 was to be the most advanced aircraft in the world. It was to be capable of around Mark 1.1 at 200 feet and Mark 2 at medium and high altitudes with a radius of action of 1,000 nautical miles. The aircraft would need a completely new, fully automatic radar system, more advanced than anything else in existence, including terrain following and sideways looking radar with automatic updating of data. It was to be capable of taking a full reconnaissance fit, operate from short strips in all weather, and provide everything from long-range nuclear strike to battlefield support. No self-defense weapons were initially proposed, although there was a provision to carry four air-to-surface rockets. The government's choice of the Bristol Sidley Olympus engine was a controversial decision and was to lead to delays and massive cost overruns we were strongly in favor of a Rolls-Royce engine, um, not least because we, did con uh, we considered that the Bristol Olympus development wasn't far ahead uh, and that we would end up with a, uh, in the classic situation which should be avoided in aircraft development, that's a new, a new design of airplane with a new design of engine right from flight one. That complicates the issues. Wherever you can, you should combine a new airplane with a, um, a well-proven engine. Rolls-Royce at that day, they didn't want uh, all these aircraft succeed with Bristol engines. And this was before Rolls-Royce bought up Bristol. The TSR-2 was going to have the Bristol Olympus. The 1154 was going to have a form of the um, Bristol Pegasus. And this really didn't suit Rolls-Royce at all at the time. 
Uh, undoubtedly, the uh, development costs of the Olympus were a big factor in the escalating costs of the program, but much worse than that, in my view, was, was the unreliability of the engine. We, we did actually, as a, uh, to use the phrase I have just used, arrive at a classic situation where we had a brand new untried aeroplane with an engine which was not only unproved, it hadn't passed its um, uh, airworthiness type tests, but it actually had a known catastrophic failure on it, which put, put the TSR-2 prototype at risk when we started flying. Problems with the engine would prove difficult to resolve and were not identified until after the first flight. The Vulcan Olympus flying testbed would later blow up whilst taxiing. The government placed the contract for nine pre-production aircraft with the Vickers English Electric Consortium in October 1960, more than 18 months after the contract had first been announced. In spite of mounting opposition from the Navy and the Treasury, Britain's most ambitious aircraft project yet devised had been given the go-ahead. Vickers, under Sir George Edwards, was to be the prime contractor and responsible for the front fuselage section, which included the cockpit, weapon systems and budget control. English Electric, led by its chief designer, Freddie Page, was to concentrate on the aerodynamics, wings, tail and rear fuselage. From an early stage, the consortium responded to the project's critics in Whitehall by illustrating their design philosophy, as seen in this film extract, presented by their chief project engineer, Ollie Heath. Flaps with a tailplane so designed as to release the whole of the wing, four flap blowing, the provision of adequate thrust to weight ratio secured by powerful Olympus 22R engines giving a thrust to weight ratio of 0.6. The requirement for rudimentary, operation, rudimentary field operation by large wheels, which despite the requirements for low cross-sectional area, are stowed within the aeroplane without drag penalty. The crosswind requirements met by the large parachute, which of course also confers the short landing facility. The, range. the advanced technology of the aircraft was mirrored in the complexity of the manufacturing, which was to employ new working practices and advanced materials. Other problems relating to project management control would lead to delays. One of the um, most delaying aspects of the program was that many of the subcontractors um, were uh, working directly with the ministry uh, and not, not under the control of, of, of the central uh, con uh, management organization, that is BAC. And this, this led to complications, misunderstandings, and inevitable delays. I remember one famous occasion when I, one of the committees that I attended of industry and the ministry officials and, and civil servants from the establishments uh, and elsewhere, um, the, the chairman took a look round the room when we started in St. Giles Court, long room, full of cigarette smoke um, and, and battered cups of tea. And um, he took a look round the room, he said, I want a count taken. And there was a head count taken at this meeting and uh, there were 58 people in the room. And the chairman quite reasonably said, this is quite ridiculous, no, nobody could control a programme with meetings this size. I want you all to go away, and we're, we're, the next meeting is convened for such and such a date, and I want to see a significant reduction in the numbers at that meeting. And in due course, we all came back to the reconvened meeting, and there were 61 in the room. Uh, the Ministry, for instance, annexed control of the cockpit layout, I think arbitrarily at, at some point, um, and there was a civil servant in the Ministry who was in charge, and I quote, as far as the government was concerned. Uh, but um, there are a lot more to it than that. Uh, I think the, the contractor had a seat um, on his committee, but um, that didn't represent control either. Uh, in my own experience, we had cockpit committee meetings.